title of this lesson is from Yahweh's test of adultery. Lessons from Yahweh's test of adultery, part two. Hallelujah. And we, you guys remember the first the one. We, we talked in part one of lessons from, from Yahweh's test of adultery. We, went, we, we dealt with the book of Numbers, chapter five. We wanted to not just see the physical command of what Yahweh had written in the statute as it applied to the wife suspected of adultery, but we also wanted to understand the spiritual meaning of Yahweh's heart within that command. Amen? Again, rather than just looking at the whole surface command of, of Yahweh's law of jealousy and thinking, you know, this is all that Yahweh required and there's nothing more to it, you know, I prayed, and we, as we should all, we should pray and, and meditate and look to Yahweh's word as a whole to discover the deeper spiritual application of what Yahweh was communicating to his people Israel back in the day and to us today. Amen? So we learn that the guilty adulterous wife represents all mankind, right? Okay? And, you know, who was unfaithful and wandered away from Elohim, our heavenly husband, and we wandered into sin, right? So we see that Paul in Romans puts it like this. He says, what then are we Jews any better off? No, not at all. For we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin, as it is written, none is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for Elohim. All, say all, have turned aside. Amen? Turned aside from Yeshua, right? And there's a penalty for our adulterous sin against Yahweh. And that penalty is what? Death. That's right. We see that in Romans 6.23. It says, for the wages of sin is death. But the gift of Elohim is eternal life in Messiah Yeshua, our Lord. So, again, last week, Brother Leonardo Johnson brought a very powerful message on counting the cost. Amen? That was a good message. So, but thank goodness that our Savior and Lord Yeshua, the Messiah, counted the cost to save us, the adulterous wife. And he was not only willing, but he was well able. Say well able. Amen? To rescue and, uh, us and take us, you know, to our place as, as far as the sin and the penalty of, of our, our adultery. Amen? Let's give Yahweh praise. Amen? <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So the focus word of today's lesson for Yahweh's test of adultery is substitution. Let me hear everyone say substitution. substitution. With the Feast of Unleavened Bread coming up, I heard mention of, of reading labels from, from our dear sister Morgan and, and stuff and, and how our sins, our sins could fill the whole earth. It's true. You could be overwhelmed by our sins. Sometimes the enemy can have you getting caught up in self-condemnation and all this, and you could think there's nothing, nothing, you know, that we can do. And, and, and you know, we're just doomed to, to, to the lake of fire and condemnation, right? But... We, 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 this is a time of year during the Feast of Elohim where we remember to reflect on who? Yeshua. Yes, right. And his, his substitutionary death made on Calvary's tree on our behalf, right? Amen. So we're going to show you how Yeshua, as Israel, substituted for us as Israel the adulterous wife. Okay? All right. So, again, this is a tale of two, two Israels, okay? So Yeshua, as Israel, the perfect son of Elohim, died in our place so that we can be saved, right? As Israel. So you may ask, wait a minute, Pastor, I don't, I'm confused. Why do you call Yeshua Israel? Well, remember, just as the physical nation of Yahweh's people was named Israel and considered the firstborn son. We see in Exodus 4.22, it says this, Then say to Pharaoh, 
This is what Yahweh says. Israel is my firstborn son. And I told you, let my son go so that he may worship me. But you refuse to let him go, so I will kill your firstborn son. So just as Israel was, in the nation of Israel was Yahweh's firstborn son, we also see that Yeshua was considered the firstborn son of Elohim. In Romans 8, 29, it says, For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, in order that he might be the firstborn, meaning Yeshua, among many brothers. Amen? So Yeshua is Yahweh's firstborn son. Amen? So we look at unfaithful natural Israel who failed to glorify Elohim and became lost and eventually divorced. Yeshua, our Messiah, was physically born as the only begotten Elohim's faithful and perfect, say perfect son. Perfect son, amen? His perfect son. Thus making him Elohim's perfect Israel. Say perfect Israel. Amen. According to Yeshua himself. Yeshua himself said this in Isaiah 49. It says here, Isaiah 49, 1, Listen, O coastlands, to me, and take heed to the people, you peoples from, from afar, Yahweh has called me from the womb, from the matrix of my mother's, he has made mention of my name. What was that? Does that sound familiar? Sounds like Yeshua in Luke, right? Where, where Yeshua, before he was, he was even born out of the womb, the, Holy, the angel told Mary, his name shall be called Yeshua, right? Amen? And he has made my mouth a sharp sword. Does that sound familiar? This is a messianic prophecy. In Revelations, when he comes back, he shall, he, out of his mouth shall be a two-edged sword. Amen? Amen? And so in the, in the shadow of his hand, he has hidden me and made me a polished a st- shaft. In his quiver, he has hidden me. And he said to me, you are my servant, O Israel. He's calling, Yeshua saying his name is Israel. Amen? In whom I will be glorified. Amen. And so in Isaiah 49, this is the messianic prophecy about this Elohim servant spoken of here and identified again with the name Israel. And we look at verse 4, it says, And I said, I have labored in vain. Yeshua is still speaking. I have spent my strength for nothing and in vain, yet surely. My, my just reward is with Yahweh and my work with my Elohim. And now Yahweh says, who formed me from the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him so that Israel is gathered to him. For I shall be glorious in the eyes of Yahweh and my Elohim shall be my strength. So now we see that through the servant Yeshua, you know, who is Israel, he is bringing Israel back to Yahweh. So how can Israel bring back Israel? If we're just talking about the nation of Israel, how can the nation of Israel bring themselves back to Yahweh? They can't. They're the lost, adulterous wife. But we need the perfect Israel, amen? Because Yeshua is the faithful, righteous Israel who is an overcomer. He will save the unfaithful, unrighteous Israel who failed miserably and became lost in sin. Amen. Let's give Yahweh praise. Amen. Hallelujah. As we'll see, Yeshua is the faithful, righteous servant Israel, again, who will save the unrighteous, natural Israel. And, you know, and, and this did not just extend to his, he didn't just extend his light to the natural olive branches of Israel, but also to the wild olive branches of the nations of the whole world. By faith, you know, we all will be grafted in as a part of Yeshua, who is Yahweh Elohim's one true Israel. Amen? Let's give Yahweh praise. Amen? Hallelujah. So we look at Isaiah 49, 6, which says, Indeed, he says, it is too small a thing for you. Should 
you, you should, should be this, my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob. And this parenthesis is mine, of course. All the parentheses are mine for mo- mo- most of the part. Meaning all, all the 12 tribes, not the natural descendants of the man Jacob. And you see a tree on, on the um, slide there. And the tree represents Yahweh's spiritual Israel, his kingdom of heaven. And you see on there is a, is, is a grafting. You could actually graft a, you know, a wild um, olive branch onto a tree and it'll grow as a part of the tree. And then you see two, two examples. You see an example of a wild olive, olive branch and a natural olive branch and, and things like that right next to each other underneath that. But so, so it's, we're talking about, it goes on, it says in, in verse, tw- um, uh, in, verse in, in, in Isaiah 49, 6, it says, and to restore the preserved ones of Israel, I will also give you as a light to the Gentiles that you should be my salvation to the ends of the earth. Amen. Let's give Yahweh praise. Amen. Amen. He's talking about us. This is what, you, what I heard when I came in. Amen. Today, I heard every, the people talking about how Yeshua is the answer. He's the key. So the Messiah Yeshua can also be called Israel. Amen. Indeed, the coming Messiah is from, is from Judah, the royal lineage of David, who ruled when Judah was a tribe of the undivided Israel. Messiah did not come from a divorced and lost seed such as the northern kingdoms, which became lost you know, among the nations. And by the nations, we mean the Gentiles. You know, the Gentiles who were once Elohim's people through Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. You know, and you can even count Noah's sons in there. You know, Messiah came from Elohim the Father, and he is the true righteous embodiment of Elohim's united kingdom, spiritual Israel. And Yeshua is, as Israel, the firstborn son of Elohim, obeyed Elohim's law perfectly. He came down to earth to serve Elohim the Father and men by substituting himself. Say substituting Man, remember the watch word for days less is substitution. He substituted himself to die for natural Israel and the rest of the world who was also the unfaithful adulterer's wife of Elohim. Now all mankind who by faith in Yeshua shares in his substitutional death and burial. So now we can share in his what? His resurrected new life. Amen? Amen? And so we... as. As we, we can be remarried as a part of Yeshua's body. Amen. Yahweh's kingdom of Israel, spiritual Israel. We can now share in the privileges of the firstborn son because Yeshua took our place and died on Calvary's tree. We are enabled to be united again as a part again of Yeshua who is Israel, Yahweh's true kingdom of heaven. Amen. Hallelujah. So let's look at the definition of, of, of substitution. Webster's revised the unabridged dictionary. Well, it says the act of substituting, this is what Yeshua did, or putting one person or thing in the place of another. And this is a, a biblical principle, which you will see. Uh, you know, um, the substitution of an agent, attorney, or representative to act for one in his absence. The substitution of banknotes and gold and silver of, of circulated medium. We know Yahweh, Yeshua's sacri- substitutional sacrifice was priceless. Amen? And, and then two says, the state of being substituted for another, the office three of, of or, or authority of one acting for another, delegated authority, you know, uh, four, the designation of a person in a, will, in a will to take a device or legacy, either on failure of the former devisee, which is, which is natural Israel, right? And, um, and, and um, or, or leg, leg, legatee by incapacity uh, by, or unwillingness to accept or after him. So, five, the doctrine that M- Messiah suffered vicariously, and this is the main one that we're talking about here, being substituted for the sinner and that his sufferings were ex- expiatory. Amen. So we even see the scientific substitution, the act of process of substituting an atom or radical for another atom or radical, right? Metathesis. But 
We're going to get on to 2 Corinthians 2, 5, and we'll see how, how substitution is a biblical uh, principle. In, in, in 1 Corinthians 5, 5, 21, it says, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteous of Elohim. 1 Peter says, He himself bore our sins in, our, in his body on the tree, so that... Um, you, he, we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds, we have been healed. Again, Peter says, For Messiah died for sins once and for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to Elohim. He, he, has, he was put to death in the body, but made alive by the Spirit. Isaiah 53 is the one that we all probably are familiar with. But he was pierced for whose transgression? He was crushed for whose iniquity? Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. Amen. Let's praise Yahweh. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. These verses along with the, 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 the definitions we saw in Webster's Revised and Abridged Dictionary teach us that the main goal, goals involved and the substitutionary sacrifice of Messiah became, it teaches us what Yahshua, you know, broke down and, 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 and what he did for us. Amen? And so, so in a nutshell, the goal was to provide atonement. Amen? Where an expiation was made for us. Amen? Some of you are probably wondering, what, what does expiation mean? Well, we, we see in the next slide here, it says, what is the difference between atonement and expiation? Atonement is to attain the forgiveness of, for some sin or transgression. In other words, I atoned for betraying my husband or friend. It is something, in Yeshua's case, he was both her husband and our closest friend, right? Amen? It is something that Elohim enables you to have a part in through faith and repentance. Amen? Atonement. So we can share in that part. Amen? But we access his atonement through faith and repentance in him. But now expiation means to clear away the record. Amen? To make it as if it never existed. It is something that Yahweh does alone. We can't clear away our record. Our record. But he, only he can do this on his part. In other words, by his substitutionary death, Yahweh Elohim satisfies the payment due for the sinfulness of man. Amen. Let's praise Yahweh. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now with this in mind, let's consider the possibility that Paul's wording about Yeshua's substitutionary death in Colossians 2 is a reference to Yahweh's law test of the adulterous wife in Numbers chapter 5. All right? So things that make you say, hmm. Everyone go, hmm. Okay. Could the criteria that Yahweh re required for the wife guilty of adultery in Numbers chapter 5 ha have prophetic implications that needed to be met or fulfilled by Yeshua in his substitutionary work on Calvary's tree? Well, let's look at Colossians 2.13. And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Amen? So there, there are some difficult verses here for some to explain. Many, however incorrectly used these two verses as proof texts in saying that Yeshua did away with Yahweh's law. But is this really possible? Is, is Father Yahweh's law really what Yeshua nailed to the cross? Is this really what Paul is, is referencing in, in his letter to the Colossians? Paul agreed that everything in the law and the prophets is mentioned um, in Acts 24, verse 14. Paul himself said this. 
We look, it says, in, it says Acts 21, I believe everything, this is Paul speaking, that agrees with the law and that is written in the prophets. And so Paul lived in obedience to the law according to Acts 21 verse 24. It says, then everybody will know there is no truth in these reports about you. And this is you as Paul and his disciples, the 12 disciples were talking to him, you know. But that you yourself are living in obedience to the law. In other words, just to, you know, there's no truth in that you're not living in obedience to the law, Paul. So you need to, the disciples wanted him to go through the, the cleansing rituals of the, of the temple to prove that he was living in obedience to the law. And, you know, and so the 12 disciples told Paul to, again, you know, to, to do something to prove that these accusations were false. You know, accusation that he was preaching against Moses. So Acts 21, uh, 21 says, They have been informed that you teach all the Jews who live among the Gentiles to turn away from Moses, telling them not to circumcise their children or live according to our customs. So these accusations are still being spread about Paul to this day in popular Christianity, you know? Knowing that Peter warned against those who misrepresent Paul to mean lawlessness or that we, can, that we were doing away with the law, can we really hold any, say any, interpretation of Paul's writings to say that he opposed the law? Remember, his own words declared that he agrees with everything in the law and the written in the law and the prophets. So we, we saw that in, in Acts 21, 14. He said, I believe everything that agree, agrees that agrees with the law and that is written in, in the prophets. So knowing this, we can't let our interpretation of Paul's writings, you know, make him out to be a hypocrite. You know, he Paul's not doing one thing yet saying another. Paul was once a Pharisee, and though the Pharisees were, were steeped in their traditions, they studied the word, amen? And Paul did as well. Paul's writings were, were deep, very deep. So much so that they created confusion for many who were unlearned in Yahweh's Torah law. With this in mind, knowing the history of the apostle Paul as a Pharisee, and that he believed in a tie and lived according to everything that was written in the law and the prophets, doesn't it make sense that Paul in Colossians chapter 2 would not be doing away with Elohim's law, but instead use illustrations and examples from Yahweh's law and the prophets such as Moses or David? You know, let's, let's look at, again at Colossians chapter 2. We see here, you know, and remember this is something that many people misrepresent. Paul. But we see that Paul, he, he gave this as a reference and we're, we're, gonna, we're going to see that he gave this as a reference where Yeshua's substitutionary work fulfilled the requirements of Yahweh's law given through Moses concerning the adulterous wife in Numbers chapter 5. Amen. So this is Paul talking again to the Gentile churches, the Gentile church of Colossians. He says, and being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, Hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. So, as we compare Numbers 5 with what Paul says in Colossians 2 about Yeshua's substitutionary uh, death, we're going to see what... Um, that, that Paul is actually reinforcing his argument in favor of the law. Amen? So how many of you know that throughout the history of, uh, uh, you know, of Israel, lost Israel was not only caught by more than two or three witnesses in, a, in adultery against Yahweh, but, they, but they, you know, they also qualified to be tried for, for death of, of stoning as, uh, you know, by Yahweh, as the always law says, a wife caught in adultery by witnesses should be. 
How many know that? Raise your hands. Amen? And so, but also, how many know that Yahweh's law also says that Israel also qualifies as the adulterous wife in Numbers chapter 5, who could not be judged in man's court because there was no human witnesses available to convict her. So the judgment was taken out of man's hands and Yahweh himself judged her guilty or, or not of the adultery that she secretly kept hidden from men, but that could not, she could not hide from Yahweh's lie detector. Amen? Right? Amen? So, so we see, Maurice brought up a point about how we think we're in control. This adulterous wife thought she was in control. She thought she had it taken care of. She was not caught by people cheating with her, on her husband. She was not caught by her husband cheating on her. She thought she could get away with it, right? But as we see in the next slide, the judgment day, you know, amen? Amen? So Yahweh himself judges and brings our adultery that is hidden in darkness to light. And similar to Adam and Eve who attempted, remember with the fig leaves? You know, they, they attempted and failed to hide their sin. Yahweh's law of jealousy written in Numbers chapter 5 shows his mercy. Say mercy. And, and that doesn't, his mercy, that doesn't require the guilty wife to be immediately put to death. Doesn't require her to be stoned to death. Amen? Which is the penalty for a wife caught by two or three witnesses, you know, in adultery. But her penalty is, is Yahweh's chastisement of a curse, just like Adam and Eve. They were, they were cursed, amen? And, 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 and they, her penalty also was being divorced by Yahweh Elohim because of her unfilthy unfaithfulness, right? And her uncleanness. So, so her filthy and uncleanness. So Yahweh's Torah law instructs, instruction covers both categories of situations where the woman should be put to immediate death, but instead she's spared to live with, with the curse of her sin and most likely divorced by her husband. Probably the, even the, 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 um, the man, once he found out that the woman was, uh, had cheated on him and the curse came upon her, he probably divorced her, you know? But Yahweh Elohim mercifully and gracefully gives the guilty wife time, say time, Time to repent because Yeshua, the living Torah or word, amen, Elohim in the flesh has to come down to earth and die in order to remarry the lost sheep of Israel. You know, since, since Elohim's divorced her, amen? Let's praise, praise Yahweh, amen? Yeshua came down so that he could remarry her. Again, we think that, that maybe we've gone too far. We think that the, what is, the, is the adulterous woman who was, who was caught in her guilt and cursed, is she beyond the redemption? No. Amen? This is what I want to encourage you about, brothers and sisters. No, we see here, um, we've already seen that Yeshua became Yahweh's faithful servant Israel to substitute for the unfaithful ex-bride Israel, right? However, that was specifically so Yahweh could remarry and, and unite as one with his bride, the 12 tribes, because a kingdom divided against itself will not stand, right? Amen? Hallelujah. So in, in Colossians 2, 1, apply, you know, it, 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 we asked the question, is Colossians 2, 1 applying to our ex-heavenly husband, Yeshua's substitutionary death to us? As, as, as the Numbers chapter 5 adulterer's wife, who is mercifully allowed to, con to temporarily live with the curse of, of sin and, and, and be divorced so that while we're living that, we, we can have an opportunity to repent, amen, and be redeemed, amen? That's the question that we're, that we're asking, amen? So again, we look at the events. Uh, let's look at the events of Yeshua's substitutionary death and find what we see in regards to the verses in Colossians 2, okay? What, let's look at what John said in John chapter 19, 28 and 29 regarding Yeshua's, Yeshua on Calvary's tree. John says, later knowing that all 
was now completed. And so that the scriptures would be fulfilled. Say scriptures would be fulfilled. Yeshua said, I am thirsty. Say, I am thirsty. Amen. 29, a jar of wine vinegar was there. So they soaked a sponge in it and put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant and lifted it to Yeshua's lips. Amen. Remember, this is to fulfill scripture. And this is why Yeshua said, I thirst. And so the scripture would be filled fulfilled. Amen. So the, again, the big question is, what scripture found in the law and prophets will be fulfilled by drinking, by offering a drink of something bitter like vinegar wine to, for Yeshua to taste? I found one good scripture from the prophet David. Everyone knows David was a prophet, right? As well as a king. Psalm 69, 21. They also gave me gall. Gall is a bitter tasting poison. You know, remember they, they stuck the spear up to his mouth with, with the sponge? For my food and for my thirst, they gave me vinegar to drink. Amen? So we see that on the surface, the physical side of, of this scripture is, is fulfilled. But is that all there is to it? As in all scriptures that Yahweh had, had Yeshua and others fulfill, isn't there a deeper spiritual meaning that Yahweh is communicating or alluding to here, you know, that we should look for? How many times in the scriptures did Yeshua do things a certain way and it is said he only said or did it to fulfill how the prophetic scriptures said it would happen that way? For example, the donkey. Did Yeshua really need the donkey to go into Jerusalem? Of course he didn't. But he did it because the scriptures said it was going to happen that way. The deeper spiritual meaning or principle found in the, in the symbolic gesture of a king riding on a plain colt or donkey represented the true nature of humility found within the character of our Savior and King. Amen? A humility that we as his followers, who are supposed to be a, a part of a holy nation of priests and kings, should have as a, a part of our own Holy Spirit-inspired nature. Amen? Those things that were prophesied, which required action on, on Yeshua's part, he had to make sure they happened not only for the deeper, deeper spiritual lessons they communicated for our edification, but also for the, the many witnesses around him, Yeshua, and we who read the Old and New Testament scriptures today, that we, that we would have no excuse that, for seeing how prophecy was taking place right before their eyes and, and being fulfilled right before their eyes. Amen? But yet other prophecies that required action on the part of others besides Yeshua were clearly orchestrated by the Spirit. For example, consider various surround, surroundings verses in John 19, like such as 28 and 29, you know, um, uh, I mean, such as uh, John 19, 24. Let's, let's, it says here, this is a soldier speaking. Let's not tear it, they said to one another. Let's decide by lot who will get it. This happened that the scriptures might be fulfilled, which said they divided my garments among them and cast lots for my clothes. So this is what the soldiers did. Now, it's interesting because <clears throat> in a deeper spiritual significance <clears throat> of, of the soldiers being led by the spirit to not tear Yeshua's garment, we can, this can be linked to Yeshua being the eternal priesthood of Melchizedek and how in that very moment as he hung on the crucifix, he was performing his priestly duties to, to pro, uh, providing himself as a substitutionary sacrifice of a, for atonement for his people. Amen? So in Exodus 28, 32, the priest's robe or garment 
whose design by I mean whose design by but was by Elohim, you know himself. He basically designed it, and and this is the spiritual symbol, symbolism of it all. He designed it so that it would prohibit tearing during during the uh, priestly duties. It did outfit for being tear, you know torn. Okay, this was what Yahweh specifically commanded, and so we see that it says. And with an opening at his top, at, at, in the center, around the opening, there shall be a woven collar with an opening like that of a garment, so that it will not tear. So the more you mine Yahweh's word, like, like a coal miner, like a, like, a, like a diamond mine, or whatever, the more spiritual diamonds and rubies and gold you'll find as you, re, as you realize that nothing Yahweh does is shallow or meaningless. Amen? There's levels of revelations and truth in every jot or tittle of Elohim's law. Amen? Another example of people outside of Yeshua being led by the Spirit to do things to fulfill Scripture is in John 19.34. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced Yeshua's side with, with with a spear. Thank you. Bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. Now, just in, in the blood and water alone, you can, you can preach messages, right? On, on the spiritual symbolism and deep meaning of that. The man who saw it was given, has given testimony, and his testimony is true. He knows that he, he tells the truth, and he testifies so that you also may believe. These things happen so that the scriptures would be fulfilled. Amen? Say the scriptures would be fulfilled. Not one of its bones will be broken. And as another scripture says, it gives another reference. They will look on the one who they have perished. Amen? Hallelujah. So unlike here in John 19... 34 and 36, where, 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 where the, word, the wording of multiple Old Testament scriptures is, is referenced as being fulfilled concerning the piercing of Yeshua, side, the nearby scripture referencing John 19, 80, uh, 19, 28, and 29 isn't as spelled out in, to support the action of Yeshua saying, I am thirsty. They don't, they don't spell out that, that scripture so much. So we see here it says, what scripture found in the law and the prophets would be fulfilled by offering a drink of something bitter like, like vinegar wine to, for Yeshua, right? And, and, and so we already saw Psalm 69, 21, but unless you're educated by Paul in the law or, or had a revelation as Paul had of the Holy Spirit, you wouldn't know about Psalm 69. But is that all there is to it? Is Psalm 69 all there is to it? Should we stop at simply presuming that the physical act of Yeshua being given vinegar wine from a sponge fulfilled Psalm 69? Or is there another scripture that this act fulfilled that has a deeper spiritual meaning or revelation? Amen? So, the Apostle Paul, I'm going to, again, suggest he communicated that revelation in Colossians chapter 2. In essence, we have, we have found the scripture fulfilled in why Yeshua said, I thirst. This illustration is found in his substitutionary sacrifice for us the adulterous wife of Numbers chapter 5. So let's read Numbers chapter 5. It says, Then Yahweh said to Moses, Speak to the Israelites and say to them, If a man's wife goes astray and is unfaithful to him by sleeping with another man, and this is hidden with her from her husband, and her impurity is undetected since there is no witnesses against her, and she has not been caught in the act, 
And if feeling, feelings of jealousy come over her husband and he suspects his wife and she is impure, or if he is jealous and suspects her even though she is not impure, then he is to take his wife to the priest. He must also take an offering of a tenth of an ephah of barley flour on her behalf. He must not pour oil on it or put incense on it because it is a grain offering for jealousy, a reminder offering to draw attention to guilt. And we see the next slide, verse 16. The priest shall, shall bring her and have her stand before Yahweh that he shall take some holy water in a clay jar. Remember, John 19, 29 says that while well, Yeshua hung on the cross, a jar, probably clay, of wine vinegar was offered to him. And, and, and put some dust from the, from the tabernacle floor into the water. After the priest has had the woman stand before Yahweh, he shall loosen her hair and place her hand, the, the reminder offering, the grain offering for jealousy, while he himself holds the bitter water. Now remember, in this case, Yeshua is both the priest and the offering, right? You know, the, and, the one, and the one drinking the offering, the, the bitter water. Okay? So he himself holds the bitter water that, that brings a curse. 19. Then the priest shall put the, the woman under oath and say to her, if no other man has slept with you and you have not gone astray and become impure while, while married to your husband, may this bitter water, say bitter water, that brings a curse not harm you. And then we next slide, verse 20. But if you have gone astray while, while married to your husband and have defiled yourself by sleeping with a man other than your husband, here the priest is to put the, the woman under this curse of the oath. May Yahweh cause your people to curse and denounce you when he causes your thigh to waste away and your abdomen to swell. May this water that brings a curse enter your body so that your abdomen swells and your thigh waste away. Then the woman is to say, Amen. So be it. The priest is to write these curses on a scroll and then wash them off into the bitter water. He shall have the woman drink the bitter water that brings a curse. And this water, say this water, will enter her and cause bitter suffering. Say bitter suffering. So take note that in the following verses of Numbers 5, which is, you know, uh, 26 and 27, Yahweh reiterates to Moses this point again. And when something is repeated in Scripture, that means it's something that's very special, very important, right, to take note of. So we, we read Numbers 5, 26. The priest is then to take a handful of the grain offering as a memorial offering and burn it on the altar. After that, he is to have the woman drink water. Amen. Say drink water. If she has fulfilled herself or defiled herself and been unfaithful to her husband, then when she is made to drink the water that brings a curse, it will go into her and cause bitter suffering. Her admin will swell and her thigh waste away, and she will become accursed among the people. This is what is referred to as the law of jealousy, Yahweh's law of jealousy. Amen? In, in, number, in Numbers 5.29, you know, this is, when, this is when the law of jealousy, you know, this is the law of jealousy when a woman goes astray and defiles herself while married to her husband. So why, why is this significant? Because of Israel's husband, Yahweh, is, is, is righteously jealous because he was married to her and who was supposed to be his wife and his wife alone. Amen? He's righteously jealous. We look at Exodus 34, 14. It says, Yahweh says, Do not worship any other god, 
for Yahweh whose name is jealous is a jealous Elohim. Deuteronomy says, for Yahweh your Elohim is a consuming fire, a jealous Elohim. Amen? So remember the adulterous northern kingdom was divorced. You know, because, you know the, the house of Israel was divorced because Yahweh considered himself a husband to Israel who cheated and broke his lawfully wedded marriage covenant with her. Amen? Look at Jeremiah 31, 32. Jeremiah, it says, It will not be like the covenant I made with, her, with their forefathers when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt because they broke my covenant though I was a husband to them, declares Yahweh. And Isaiah 54, 5 says, For your maker is your husband. Yahweh Almighty is his name. The Holy One of Israel is your Redeemer. He is called the Elohim of all the earth. Amen? Hallelujah. So we look at the next slide, and we see Numbers 5.23. The priest is to write these curses on a scroll and then wash them off into the bitter water. Remember, the scroll mentioned in Numbers 5.23. Amen? This scroll contains the handwriting of ordinances, amen, that Paul was referencing in Colossians chapter 2, amen. It was these ordinances in the handwriting on the scroll that was contrary to us, the adulterous wife, or, or against us, amen, the, the wife guilty of adultery. It was these written ordinances that was washed or blotted off the scroll into the cup of bitter water, and then nailed to Calvary's tree through Yeshua's a, a, a substitutionary death. Amen? Remember, Yeshua is Elohim in the flesh. And he was both the high priest and the given substitutionary sacrifice that had to be drunk. You know? so, 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 this, so this sacrifice had to be, had to be drunk. And this cup... Is, is prescribed in the law of the wife accused of, of adultery. This was the bitter cup that Yeshua had to drink. Amen? So, that, so this is why he said, <clears throat> I thirst. Amen? Because he had to make sure that this happened to fulfill scripture. So we understand why Yeshua prayed in the garden. In the, in the next slide. Matthew 26, 29, going a little further, he fell from, from his face to the ground and prayed, My father, if it be possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. We also want to compare verses 14 in Colossians. In the next slide, Colossians 2, 14, <clears throat> blotted out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailed it to the cross. Again, this again is the handwriting of ordinances. This, is, this was the curse mentioned in Numbers 5.21, that he took away from us the adulterer's wife. So here we see Yeshua not only died, so he could remarry his divorced bride, but he took the place of her judgment, amen? Nailing the judgment to the cross. He had to drink from this cup, the cup of bitter water that was meant to be given to the wife accused of adultery. Say substitution, amen? He knew that the outcome of this cup would bring the curse would bring bitter suffering. And thus he prayed for it to be taken away, amen, in the garden that night. We also want to consider the verse regarding the curse, in, 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 in this verse again in, regarding the curse in, in, um, in Numbers 5. Again, may Yahweh cause, in 521, may Yahweh cause your people to curse and denounce you that when he causes your thigh to waste away, and your abdomen to swell. So we look at, may Yahweh cause your people to curse and denounce you. Now, considering what happened, now consider what happened to Yeshua while he was hanging on the tree in Matthew's 
27, 39. Those who passed by hurled insults at him. And they were shaking their heads at him, right? They cursed and denounced him at the very timing that the curse was going forth. And that timing, and what timing was that? Again, we, we read in Numbers 5, 21, on the next slide, Yahweh caused your people to curse and denounce you when he, when, this is the timing, when he causes your thigh and waist to waste away and your abdomen to swell. It was the time that his thigh was wasting away and his abdomen swelling. First his thigh in the law, I want you to understand something, the symbolism, the, spirit, the deeper spiritual meaning of, of, of the thigh in Yahweh's law is the, the thigh is, is representative of an individual's word or credibility, amen? Or even authority. It, all this is represented in the thigh from a Hebrew thought process, okay? Okay? And so um, it was symbolically used in matters of keeping one's word. This is why we see that oaths were given when a man's hand was under the, the other's thigh, okay? For example, Genesis 24, 9. So the servant put his hand under the thigh of his master Abraham and swore an oath to him concerning this matter. And in Genesis 47, 29, when the time drew near for Israel to die, Israel meaning Jacob, he called for his son Joseph and said to him, if I have found favor in your eyes, put your hand under my thigh and promise that you will not that, I mean, that you will show me kindness and faithfulness. Do not bury me in Egypt. Thus the thigh wasting away would be representative of one's credibility being useless. Okay? So when Yeshua did not give the proof that the crowds demanded of him for being the son of Elohim, his credibility meant nothing. Amen? Consider this, Matthew 20, 27, 40 to 43, and, say, and saying, you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. This is the people yelling at Yeshua as he's hanging on the cross. Save yourself. Come down from the cross. If you are the son of Elohim, in the same way the chief priest, the teachers of the law, and the elders mocked him. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross, and, and we will believe in him. We trust in Elohim. Let, I mean, you know, he, he, he trusts in Elohim. Let Elohim rescue him now if he wants him. For he said, I am the son of Elohim. So Yeshua held no cre credibility with, with them, and yet there will be no mistaking his word or credibility or authority when he comes the second time, right? In the second coming. His thigh will make it very clear. Look at Revelation 19, 15, 8, 16. It says, out of his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the wine presses of the fury of the wrath of Elohim Almighty. On his robe and on his what? He has his name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Amen. Let's give Yahweh praise. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's interesting to note that some say that according to certain definitions, the strongest muscle in the, in the human body is usually said to be the quadriceps located in the thigh. Hey man, we just went biking, right? You know, me, me and Jube and Jamie the other day, and, and uh, yeah, we had to use that thigh muscle a lot. But, um, but anyway, so though on the cross, his strength appeared as weakness to, to the people watching, there will be no question to his strength at his second coming. Though, though a spiritual understanding of the thigh is enough to get one's attention, Let's look at the actual physical thigh, amen, uh, of Yeshua on, on the cross and how it wasted away on that torture stake, amen? 
It was the thighs that one used to raise yourself up in order to breathe when being crucified. After all his suffering and torture that happened after it happened before ever even being nailed to the tree. Remember? He was suffered so much even before getting on the tree. And then after several hours of constantly lifting himself up on, on, on the tree just to, to struggle to breathe, his thighs finally gave way. Perhaps I should say wasted away. This supports many who contend that Yeshua actually suffocated after saying it is finished. Because truly his thigh could lift him no more. There was no strength left. He suffocated as a result of his thighs wasting away. This is why the two thieves next to him, they didn't have to go through all these trials and stuff that night. They, like he did. Amen. So they, they had to have their legs broken. Right? Amen. And things of that nature. So, you know, but Yeshua didn't. It was so that but they, they, they were using their thighs to push themselves up more and more. And, and, and so if you broke their legs, they couldn't use that, and then they would suffocate. But what about Yeshua's abdomen? For it says, remember in Numbers 5.21, May Yahweh cause your people to curse and denounce you when, you, when he causes your thigh to waste away and your abdomen to swell. Everyone take a real deep breath. And what happens to your chest when you take a deep breath? Now blow it out. What happens to your, to your chest? It goes in and what happens to your stomach? When you, when you take a deep breath, your chest puffs up, your stomach sucks in. When you blow, blow it out, you keep doing it again. Take a deep breath. Blow it out. What happens to your stomach? It swells, right? All right. That's the good job. That's the word I'm looking for. And so... As we look at this, when we all take deep breaths to fill our lungs with air, right? It's a big, strong breath that we take in. A strong breath is when your chest is forced out. But what about a relaxed breath? Does your chest rise or does your stomach? Your stomach rises, of course. The, the lungs can, be, can only expand so much because of the rib cage. And just as electricity or water travels best in the path of least resistance, likewise, our lungs expand toward the least resistance given. In a relaxed state, that expansion is downward. Normally, our abdomen rises just as much, if not more, in, in relaxed breathing. However, this is not what caused Yeshua's abdomen to swell on the torture stake. Remember, he's in all kind of pain. Everything's even more exaggerated with his body. Amen? Just, uh, I want you to stay here. Stay with me here. Let's think about it for a minute. Our Savior had been up all night in a mock trial. Plus, we know that he was stressed. As, as it is recorded that his sweat was mixed with blood the night uh, of, pray, of praying in the garden. We see in Luke twenty-two forty-four. 44, and being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became, as it were, great drops of blood falling down into the ground. Hematosis is what that's called scientifically. It's not like he, he entered this day with a good night's sleep or had a good night's uh, a meal, before, you know, like they give people on death row uh, their, their last meal before they die. He wasn't, you know, no. He didn't get on all that. Amen? So, so he had been up for 24 hours after being smacked around, spit upon, you know, for, he was smacked around by the Pharisees and having had his beard pulled. It pulled. He, he, he gets beaten up by the Roman soldiers and, and then presented to his people with a crown of thorns. Then he gets flogged to the point of hardly having human recognition, according to Isaiah, Right? Look at Isaiah 52, 14. Thus, it, thus as there were many who were appalled at him, his appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any man and his form marred beyond human likeness. 
Then he, he, he has to carry his own wooden crucifix. He falls on under its weight. Boom. Unable to go any further to, to, stay, to say he, he, he has any strength to breathe strong while on, the, on, the, on the, the crucifix is pushing it. His body is spent and, and exhausted. Every breath taken is in weakness, not strength. But he wasn't only unable to breathe strong. Most all who have studied the science behind the crucifix of Yeshua would agree that his lungs, in fact, filled with fluids while he hung on the crucifix at the hands of the Romans. The sheer weight of the fluid filled the lungs, filling the lungs would be enough to pull down on his lungs and push the, the abdomen out. Amen? Not, this is not much different from filling a water balloon. No matter how small, the more you fill it, not only does it get bigger, but it also stretches and pulls down from the weight. Plus, what little breathing he was doing that his lungs could take in, that, that is, was only pushing the stomach further down. This, in turn, forced our Savior's abdomen to swell out. Just as it is written in the curse, is given in Numbers chapter 5 to the unfaithful wife. Plus, verse 27 adds an element of bitter suffering. As you see, Numbers 5, 27 says, If she were defiled, has defiled herself and has been unfaithful to her husband, then when she is made to drink the water that brings a curse, it will go into her and cause what? Bitter suffering. That's right. Her abdomen was, will swell and her thigh waste away and she will become accursed among her people. I think there, there can be no argument that Yeshua endured the bitter suffering of the, on, cruci on the crucifix, right? Thus he took the cursed punishment of the unfaithful spouse, say substitution, right? He... He was brought before the Sanhedrin just like the woman was to be brought before the priest. There were no witnesses for proof with Pilate. And Pilate found no fault and declared it. We see that in Luke 23, 4, when Pilate announced to the chief priest and to the crowd, I find no basis for a charge against this man. So this, thus the need for Yeshua to drink the cup to prove the guilt we, we again compare Numbers 5, 23 to 24. It says, And the priest is to write these curses on a scroll and then wash them off into the bitter water. He shall have the woman drink the bitter water that brings a curse. And this water will enter her and, and cause bitter suffering. He, Yeshua, took the curse as mentioned in verse 23 and nailed it to the crucifix. He took the curse in Numbers um, chapter 5 that applied to the unfaithful wife and nailed it to the crucifix through his substitutionary death just as mentioned in Colossians 2. Colossians 2.14 says he blotted out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, against us. Well, amen, which was contrary to us and took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's give y'all we praise. Amen. <laughs> amen. So now we are completely enabled. He enabled us, his divorced wife, to be wiped clean of her guilt and to be remarried at the same time. Amen we can now be justified. Amen? Praise Yahweh. Look, look at this definition of justified. Amen? Go ahead, praise him. Go ahead, praise him. Amen? Amen? Justified de means declared to be made righteous in the sight of Elohim. Justified. Just if I'd never done it. Right? Romans 3, 23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of Elohim and are what? justified freely by the grace through the redemption that came by 
Messiah Yeshua. He takes our sin and removes it through his substitutionary death. Amen. Let's give him praise again. Amen. Hallelujah. We see Romans 6, 3 says, Or are you ignorant that all we who were baptized in Messiah, Yeshua, were baptized into his death? In other words, the, the, the adulterous woman gets to share in Yeshua's substitutionary death. Amen? Uh, in his death on, on the cross, we must, re uh, amen? Hallelujah. Um, um, we were buried, therefore, with him through baptism unto death. That like as Messiah was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we also might walk in newness of what? We were to walk in life. We don't continue to walk in sin, but the newness of life. For if we have become untied with him in the likeness of his death, amen, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man was crucified. That old, that old identity as the adulterous wife was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away that so we should no longer be in bondage to sin. For he that hath died is, what? Justified from sin. But if we died with Messiah, remember we, we die, must die so that Yeshua can live in us, right? Amen? We believe that we shall also live with him. For we know that since Messiah was raised from the dead, we, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once and for all. But the life he lives, he lives to Elohim. Amen? Let's praise Yahweh. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Verse 11 says, In the same way count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to Elohim in Messiah Yeshua. So he removed all barriers that prevented the northern kingdom from from coming to him through the, his death on Calvary. We must remember that the law was never a barrier that kept anyone from Yahweh. No. It was the sin, amen, the sin of the northern kingdom that kept them from him. It's sin that separates us from Elohim, right? Not Yahweh's law that separates us, right? Amen. The curse that resulted in not obeying the law or Yahweh's Torah is what, you know, is, it, he, his, he, that's what, his perfect instruction. That's what Yahweh's law is. It's his perfect instruction. The, it, that's, but it, that's what separated us. Amen? And that's, that was our chastisement. But the law has never stood opposed to anyone, amen, who obeyed Yahweh's law. The law itself is, 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 is pro-Yahweh. Amen? It blesses. Those who obey, and it curses totally, you know, totally depending on one's obedience or lack thereof, you know. So, thus our obedience produces blessings and our disobedience produces curses. Yet, he, Yeshua, removed all barriers so all can come to him in faith. Amen? Hallelujah. So all, say all can come into covenant with him as before. Look at Galatians 3.22. For the, the scripture declares that the whole world, say the whole world, is a prisoner of sin, so that what was promised being given through faith in Yeshua Messiah might be given to those who believe. But let us not forget that faith by itself is dead, according to James. So for those who think the law still want to say this, the law is done away with, we did, we, we, he died and saved us so that we can walk in good works. Amen? Right? So James 2.24 says, you, shall, you see that a, a, a person is justified by what he does and not by faith alone. Amen? Yeshua didn't die and suffer and take the adulterous woman's curse just so us, for us to continue to be adultery, committing adultery, Right? No, right? If we are truly re reunited with him by way of his marriage covenant, 
whether we want to call it new or renewed covenant, uh, marriage covenant, or whatever you want to call it, the proof will be in us walking according to that covenant as given in Jeremiah and Ezekiel. We look at Jeremiah 31, 33. This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after that time, declares Yahweh. I will put my law in their minds and write it in, on their hearts. I will be their Elohim and they will be my people. Ezekiel 36 says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove you from you, your heart of stone, and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow, say follow, my decrees and be careful, say careful, to keep my laws. However, there's one more element before I close that I want to share with you, okay? Um, in, in Numbers chapter 5, that, that needs to be considered. Numbers chapter 5, 31, the husband will be innocent of any wrongdoing, but the woman will bear the consequences of, of her sin. Again, we, we are emphasizing that if found guilty, the woman will bear the consequences of her sin. She will bear the shame of her sin before her people. The shame of her sin will ever be before her. Forever and ever, ever be before her, right? Amen? Amen? Is that, is that, is that what it says? Amen? So, 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 so again, the shame, say the shame. All mankind has been found to be guilty and unfaithful bride. Yet Yeshua substituted and took the shame, say the shame, on Calvary's tree so we didn't have to. Amen? Let's praise Yahweh. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Only through Yeshua can one return to such a situation of remarriage with Elohim. For, the, for those not in Messiah, this curse and shame remains. Those who accept his forgiveness and choose to walk after him, the curse of sin is removed because he took the curse for them in taking their place. But if they reject his word, the curse remains. His atonement for them will not cover them if they refuse to accept it and, and, and walk in his ways. John 3.36 says, Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for Elohim's wrath remains on him. And I think I might have um, lied to you guys again, everything, but uh, Philip, Philip, forgive me, forgive Philip, Philippians 3.18 says this, For as I have often told you before, and now say again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Messiah. Their destiny is, de is destruction. Their God is their stomach, and their glory is in the, their, sh what? Their mind is on earthly things, but our citizenship is in heaven. Amen? And we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Yeshua and the Messiah. Amen? Hallelujah. And Paul again alludes to, to a reference of the curse in, in Numbers 5, here in Philippians 3, 19. You see, you see that? He said their destiny is, uh, is destruction and their God is their stomach, right? Say stomach. All right, what does that remind you? Does that sound, amen? Thus... It does, you know, um, in, in Philippians 3, 19, Paul's referring to, to how the, these people remain unfaithful, these, whose God is their stomach. They, are, are pro, they, they prostitute their ways in their love for the world. They're, they have an appetite for the world. Re, remaining uh, and even glorying in their shame is in a proudful, boastful type of manner. They are making the cause of their swollen stomachs the very... God, they continue to follow. That, that of prostitution with the world, the very purpose that Yahweh divorced his people to begin with. Amen? Through Yeshua's substitutionary death, Elohim fulfilled all the requirements of his own law. As the adulterous wife 
of, of by faith repents and is born again, she is justified in Messiah as a new creation. She is no longer one who is defiled. She is no longer, say no longer. One who is divorced. She is no longer, say no longer. One who is a widow or a prostitute. She is completely new creature in Messiah who is Israel, the, unfa the faithful. Amen. Let's, let's, let's praise him some more. Amen. Hallelujah. We, Galatians 6.15 says, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything uh, it, um, that, 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 that counts. What counts is a new creation. We see 2 Corinthians 5. 17 says, therefore, if anyone is a Messiah, he is a new creature, creation. The old has gone and the new has come. Amen. We see Romans 6, 4. We are buried, therefore, with him through baptism unto death, that like a, a Messiah was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we also might walk in the newness of life. Amen. And how many here know that Yeshua Yahweh Elohim was the first high priest, amen? Way back in the garden when he first gave the first animal sacrifice for man's uh, adulterous ways, right? And Adam and Eve, right? So the, the, the Yahweh's own law says that, that basically a priest cannot marry a, a widow, uh, cannot marry a, a, a woman defiled. You know, a, pri a priest cannot marry a prostitute or, or a woman divorced, so he cannot remarry once Israel is divorced. But if Israel, if, he, if the husband dies for Israel, takes all her penalties, and Israel shares in his substitutionary death and has and is now become a new creature, she's no longer all those things, amen? And now she can be remarried, amen? Let's give you all we praise, amen? Hallelujah. And so this brings us to what, what I lied to you about and ask forgiveness, the last point. Not only are we referred to uh, as the bride, but we are also considered his children. Am I right? Remember, even in Ezekiel, he said, he, he, he said they slaughtered his children. We look at Ezekiel 16, 21. You slaughtered my children and sacrificed them to the idols. Additionally, this is another reason why, why she's condemned, the, the, the adulterous wife, not just for adultery, but for murder. Additionally, we are all children of Adam. Thus, we are all truly children of Elohim, as Adam was, and Yeshua was the second Adam. With this in mind, who performed, again, the first sacrifices? Yahweh, right? Amen. He is, in the garden, he made atonement for the sins of Adam and Eve, thus clothing them and, and covering their nakedness and their shame. We see that uh, in, in Genesis 3.21. So as a result, he is the first high priest. This, must, this means that we are all his children. Children of the high priest, or the first high priest, the priest, the eternal high priest. Knowing this, we are referred to in the feminine gender as his bride, Right? So I can't help but wonder, say, hmm, I can't help but wonder if we are all considered in the feminine gender as being children as well. For example, when the northern kingdom committed harlotry, she did so with other gods, just as the, the, uh, the other nations were doing. This means that the other gods were, were, like, were kind of like the masculine gender, is, is, is symbolized for all, thus implying that all mankind is, uh, is, is in a feminine gender in Yahweh's eyes, spiritually speaking. If this is the case, just I want you to just continue to go with me. Consider this. Leviticus 21.9 says this. If a priest's daughter defies herself by becoming a prostitute, she disgraces her father. She must be burned in what? Amen. For all those who believe that once saved, you can't, you, you know, always saved. If we are indeed all, and I mean all humanity, consider children, 
of the first high priest. And if we are considered as such in the feminine gender, would we not see something of a parallel in this judgment of, uh, in Leviticus 21, in the end of all things, for those daughters of the first high priest who committed harlotry, who wandered away from Elohim? Yes, we would, and yes, we do. Look at Revelations 20, 15. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into what? The lake of fire. So you see the deeper spiritual significance. May we never forget that Yeshua took our place on Calvary's tree. He nailed the curse of the law to the crucifix. Don't stay dead in your sins any longer, my brothers and sisters. Colossians 2.13 says, And you being dead in your sins and the circumcision, uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you how many trespasses? Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that were against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. Walk into freedom, brothers and sisters, of the marriage covenant, enabled to all to enter. Yahweh bless. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.